which feels longer than a year, has been one hell of a year. Ah, uh, 2020. So, that lots of stuff has happened in the year that was, much of what I don't feel qualified in the slightest to talk about. You... Uh, I am... <laughs> Not the presidential election. Thank God Trump is gone. By the way, if you voted for Trump, you can unsubscribe if you object to me saying I didn't vote for him. I don't care. Um, I am glad... Like, we've had the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, if you think that COVID-19 didn't exist, you can unsub... Or you refuse to wear a mask, you can also unsubscribe. I don't care. Um, but the thing that I do feel like I could reasonably talk about in the year in review is conventions both what in the sense of how they didn't happen and how they did but in a in the virtual sense and this is mainly going to be talking about virtual conventions so i went to a fair number of digital anime conventions in this past year um some professionally one runs like uh, Crunchyroll Expo Online, some fan-run ones like Otakon Online and, Kum and Kumorakon Online, and <clears throat> some various points in between, like the one-day digital anime, ex anime expo thing and the professional event like that um, Aniplex did. So, I kind of thought, I had the opportunity to give some thoughts about what worked for me, and if... Digital conventions, online conventions, are going to continue to be a thing next year. Not just in the sense of, as we get through this pandemic, because it's undoubtedly going to persist at least till summer of next year. Possibly longer. I'm, again, not a virologist, can't speak to that. Um, I There are things to discuss uh, in terms of how to do digital conventions better. So, what I won't be mentioned talking about is, I will say I will not be talking about how tabletop gaming conventions handled this, in terms of Gen, uh, GaryCon Online, uh, Gen Con Online, that sort of thing. Um, I did not go to either of those. On for, I was not really able to, to go to either of those, or did, attend, I guess is a better term. Going, get, you can't go to a convention, I mean, if you go to a digital convention, you're going to your computer and sitting down at your chair, possibly in your pajamas, um, to attend the convention. So, whatever. Uh, so, an uh, uh, alternating breakdown of what worked and what didn't, and do's and don'ts I've learned about the whole situation. Probably I'd say for the big do, is have your schedule, re is getting your schedule ready sooner is more of a big deal um to a certain extent doing an online convention lets you schedule gives you new opportunities for scheduling guests and scheduling panelists and that sort of thing because it opens you up to people who would otherwise be uh, inaccessible due to issues of travel geography and that sort of thing if you're a convention in chicago it is more difficult for you to get a Japanese attendee than it is get them if you're at if you are on a West Coast convention or eat or even some East Coast conventions depending on your level of clout. Um Morocon, we've been able to get they've been able to get Studio Trigger, they've been able to get Yoshitaka Amano. I could see that being trickier to get for say something in the Great Lakes area, for example. Uh, or even an Acon situation, because you're, you're in Texas. Uh, so that, well, that that opens up a whole bunch of options for who you can book for your convention. But it makes it more important from an attendee and a panelist standpoint to know sooner when your panel is going to be, especially from the sake of of time zones. Um, if I'm going to, for example, um, if I had, say, had submitted a panel to, um, Otakon Online and then gotten accepted, I'd done 
I had done one of my tabletop role playing game recommendation videos as a pa as a panel, or I did a video, a pa or I did a panel on the history of replays and tabletop role playing game, or that sort of thing, and done some additional research on that, or I'd gotten more research done and put something together on the history of Lodos, whatever. I could that panel would have been a like I I would have needed to know when that was. Because depending on when it's scheduled, I may need to adjust my sleep or sleep cycles so that I am sufficiently awake to give the panel as opposed to, say, getting up in the middle of the night. Not in the middle of the night. The point stands, it is important to your attendees, both, virtu both virtual attendees and panelists, to be able to know, okay, when my, pa my panel is at... 8 o'clock, either a.m. or p.m., my time, so I know, so I need to wake up accordingly to be ready to give it. That sort of thing. So, that the next part related to that is, one of the things that, that was related, that's come out of this, for all of this, for convention panel uh, programming, that I've observed, is digital conventions really change the way you program, and particularly the whole concept of counter-programming. By way of explanation, let's say you're at a, you're doing an anime convention and you have like your two main panels. That, or I can even go better. Let's, let's go to retro gaming. Uh, say something like Portland Retro Gaming Expo. You have say your couple main tracks. You have your uh, professionals from the back from the history of tabletop game uh, um, video games track. This is your David Crane's that sort of thing. And you have your fan creators track, um, your your AVGNs, your the completionists, your that sort of thing. And all of these panels are going to draw in a significant number of people. So, in these panel rooms that they're in, you have a limited number of seating available. If you put a few more people in there, the fire marshal gets angry and shuts you down. So you have to cut off at that point. So, you need some place for those other people to go. You can't just have them lingering out in the hallway, or what have you, because that also potentially causes fire code problems. This is less so for places like Oregon Convention Center, which has big, wide-open hallways and that sort of thing, but it's still it's still a concern. This is why you also have your vent dealer's room and your free play arcade and that sort of thing, but those also have the people who are using those who are just interested in those. So, this is where you have counter-programming. You have additional programming that fits those criteria, that, that scratches and itches, that is also scheduled at the same time. But ideally, you also want to schedule it in a manner where the people who are, like, who would be on the panel who would either want to go to those other panels or alternatively might even need to be on those panels are available for um, as well. So as a hypothetical example here, um, so you continue with, actually, continue with Portland Retro Gaming Expo as your example. You would, might do Completionist and the Retronauts at the same time because um, the Completionist is generally... Actually... The Retro would work either way for the um, History of Games track and for the uh, for your content creators track because they're, they're podcasters, they're content creators, but they talk about the history stuff. So, like, depending on what their planned for panel is about, so say, for example, we're at uh, Portland Retro Gaming Expo, they're doing their panel on, uh, and it's the anniversary of the release of the uh, Nintendo 64. Or the Virtual Boy. Let's say they're doing the Virtual Boy panel at that time. Um, on the one, so you will, and maybe you don't know this in advance, but you know, okay, this this is this event's happening at the same time. They're, we can reasonably estimate that the this is what the Retronauts going to do a panel about. We also have Train. We also have we have Robert Woodhead coming in to talk about the history of the Wizardry series, or like. We got Wizard, we got Robert Woodhead and Richard Garriott together to talk about the early days of tabletop of um, 
the uh their two big franchises of wizardry and Ultima. so they have a panel together that's going to be huge that's going to fill up the room it's in the biggest room in the convention center also at the same time you do the retronauts now certainly this is probably going to be like oh jeremy paris is going to be like i wanted to go to that panel um so it's maybe not the perfect example but or the perfect counter programming but the people a lot of the people who are were, would have wanted to go to the robert woodhead lord garriott to get, um panel or just the the, lord, the richard garriott panel whatever wanted to go that to those creator that historical figures of gaming panel will then go to the retronauts panel and instead of either sitting in the halls or further bunching up in the show floor that sort of thing and what this means is generally you will have and at minimum four rooms four to eight rooms running at once um somewhere in that range a track you use all of your a and b main panels and then a and b alternative possibly even a and B second alternative as well, depending on the, the number of attendees and how big those other panels are. Um, and this helps also with anime conventions on uh, the sense of that you have, this provides a way for attendees to have, um, you know, like, one thing to observe from Kamorakon is generally whatever your panel is or this is from anime conventions in general, but whatever your panel is, people will come to see it. Um, whether it's they're even if they're not necessarily actually interested in the thing, they will come in because um, something is happening and they'd like to go sit down and pay it, listen to it. And maybe because there's nothing else in the viewing rooms that are of interest, but what have you. Speaking of which, viewing rooms. Um, this is another part of the thing for the viewing rooms is it provides, in anime conventions, it provides a place for uh, attendees to Again, go sit down, not be clustered out on the floor and that sort of thing, but also engaged with something that they're interested in. Um, like, I've never been, even though we can watch anime on streaming all the time uh, these days, I've never been to an anime convention with completely empty viewing rooms. Admittedly, I have not been to anime conventions super late at night with the late night screening viewing rooms and that sort of thing. Uh, with the super night owls, there may be there may be points there where it's like no, there's actually nobody here, but generally, the viewing rooms have had occupancy, all of them all the time. Maybe not full, but there's always people watching something. So this is an important part of the counter programming as well. Now we cut to virtual conventions. Virtual conventions have the advantage of you do not have to worry about the fire marshal. You don't get shut down if too many people are trying to attend the your Cowboy Bebop cast reunion panel. To use an example of an actual panel that happened at Comoricon this year. Um, at a physical convention, if you got the Cowboy Bebop dub cast together and had them all together in a room for an hour, hour and a half, two hours... Um, talking about the show and everything else like that, that would have been the go-to panel for the convention. You would have abs like, you would have had to have um, your like all your your as many warm bodies available as you could for line management, plus making sure people didn't line up too early, um, making sure the room was completely cleared before the panel, next panel because this is the this is your main event of the show. That sort of thing. This is the, this is the big deal, and so consequently, you would also need a significant chunk of big counter programming opposite to it, because there's a whole bunch of people who just you can't go get to do that, and you don't want them just drifting off to doing something else. That sort of thing. Or for Digikumo, which is what they called the Kumorcon online here, um, you don't have to worry about that. You can have as many people watching the video as. Your, as the hosting site's bandwidth will allow. And that really changes how you do your programming shakeup. And this is where I've seen 
Various conventions handle this in different ways, and I had a few. Th and this leads me to the do, or the, the thing that you should do, I guess you. So, what you want to do is, or I recommend doing this. Is what I've seen from doing a couple other conventions with like Crunchyroll Expo online is dedicate your digital panel rooms to particular tracks. Um, since you're no la now no longer in a situation where you need to clear the panel room between panels or that sort of thing, you can just, okay, this is the main events showroom panel room. This is where we will have our big stuff. This is where you will have the Cowboy Bebop cast reunion. This is where you have main opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies. This will be, for example, if you do your AMV contest, if, if you are having an AMV contest, this is where you would do that. Um, like a little gap in between each one just for setting up and making sure everyone on the other side of the uh, video line is ready to go. Arguably, this is something that you can also have your staff doing in advance while the other panel is running. So, for example, Morricon Online, they scheduled the Cowboy Bebop reunion panel, and the um, AMV contest, the, the end of the AMV contest directly opposite each other, which I think didn't work out well. At least not for me, I had to miss the end of the AMV. And I think there's a lot of other people who bailed on the AM, on the end of the AMV contest um, to go to the Cowboy Bebop reunion panel. In fact, I suspect... If you were to look at the voting numbers for the categories that were last in the AMV panel, that in the AMV contest that were that ran into the Cowboy Bebop panel, you would see a drop off in voting numbers. That so that sort of thing, um, which for best in show did not did not do any favors to the ones who to the uh, to the. Uh, videos that would be in the main event slot or otherwise be basically like the main featured presentation slot. So again, like have your main event track, you then do a cultural experience track, your cosplay skit cosplay and cosplay skits and vignettes track, and then um as a hypothetical story for a third one, um like cosplay and crafts track and then like your humor cosplay sketches tracks. So like like four different panel rooms um, and that way that would cover, you would still get a lot of the similar content that you would otherwise have, maybe not the same numbers, but it would be organized where, okay, I'm here for cosplay sketches. I'm here to see cosplayers doing vignettes in costume, in character. I'm going to be in, I want to camp out in this room, or I'm here for the cultural content. I'm here to learn about Japanese stuff, or learn about the creators of the shows I like, or that sort of thing. I'm going to camp out in this room, or I am just here for the big stuff. I'm here for the, the Funimation panel, and the Dark Horse panel, and the um, and the big Cowboy Bebop reunion, and the AMV contest, and the um, cosplay contest, and those are all going to be in this panel room, panel video channel, and I'm just going to sit there and watch that. So to put things another way, you are not programming your panels like panels. You are programming your panels like channels on a television network. Like you are, you are, pan, you are programming four to six channels of television, and they're not doing general purpose ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS programming. You are doing Discovery Channel, Bravo, uh, um, Amy, and what's a third one? Uh, adult Swim, oh, fourth one, an Adult Swim. You're doing, you are doing it like that. So when you are programming your like video content, streaming video content for a convention like this, do program it in distinct chunks like like do recognize like that like, that's a good way to do it for a way that organize helps people 
figure out where they want to do or what they want to watch when. This also has the added advantage as well of it make is when it comes time to watch a particular panel, like once you picked out on your schedule, okay, I want to watch this panel at this time. If you know the cult, if you know what the content of it is about, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what panel, what panel channel you need to be in. Like, oh, I want to watch the channel, or watch the panel about doing Mahjong because I'm lost with watching Saki and all these other uh, Mahjong anime. So, or I want to be good at the Mahjong mini game in Yakuza. So I'm going to go to this panel and learn the ropes of of Mahjong. What panel room is going to be in? Well, it's a cultural panel, so it's going to be in panel three, or channel three, whatever you want to call it, that sort of thing. It's a good general rule of thumb for how to handle your organism. Um, best way to do it, in my opinion. This leads to the next point, um, which is um, bonds. Bonds are not going to be an option for everything and for everyone, particularly when you're dealing with Japanese guests, um, with, um, with voice actors and that sort of thing, I can certainly see a situation like, okay, you will be less likely to get someone to agree to your mention if you have just VODs available. So, but, but on the other hand, I will say, internet connection issues happen. They did not happen to me under the circumstances. Well, they happened a little bit. I had bits where something was downloading on on my console or on another computer in the household or whatever, and all of a sudden my video quality on the con on the panel on my end took a giant dump. Just went. They took a big hit. Like went from like 1080p to like 240p in like that. But there was a big download happening somewhere. I don't know, and I didn't know exactly where. And then after like 10, 15 minutes, a, or even like five minutes, boom, went back to 1080p again, no problem. Everything's peachy keen. So now I could sort of kind of rewind maybe and go back to the bit that I missed, but then that also puts me behind everything else. And if you're doing a Q&A session, that is an issue. Um... Bods don't help with Q&A sessions, um, but still, it is, it's useful to have. And what this entails for your convention, or for, for on your end, for doing VODs, is this helps compensate for that situation, where, I'm not saying, like, permanently available videos on demand on your Twitch channel, or on YouTube, or anything like that, but, I like, for a chunk of time around the date of the convention, after each panel, like for a day or two afterwards, let's say, for example, for the Monday after the convention or the Monday and Tuesday after the convention, keep the videos on demand available just so, as a hypothetical scenario, um, I need to, like, I wanted to go to the Cowboy Bebop reunion panel, I wanted to go to this panel about cooking Japanese dishes, and I couldn't go because something happened um that my cat decided to throw up all over the floor and i had to spend a bunch of time cleaning it and i missed a bunch of the panel or um something got uh, or um food order came in and i missed the start of the panel uh or just straight up my internet connection crapped out for an hour or two and i missed the, and i missed the panel entirely Having a VOD available for at least a limited time allows the attendees to go back and go, okay, during a period of the convention where there's nothing else on that I want to watch, I can go back and see the things that I missed that I would have liked to have seen, either because it was programmed against something else I wanted to watch, or I was running into connection problems on my end. So that is that is another useful option available, as far as recommendations go. My, probably my last big recommendation, and some conventions did this, some conventions didn't. Comoricon did this, and a good idea. Others less so. I don't necessarily recommend doing your streaming for the convention itself over Discord, but I do recommend having a Discord uh, for your convention. doesn't have to be an open Discord. In fact, if you're trying to do a closed attendance thing, like for 
Worldcon Online, like for other conventions. Um, having a Discord allows you to have a, a Discord server for your convention. Basically lets you get somewhat replicate, but not exactly. I think another thing is a useful part of the con experience, which is hanging out and chatting with people in, hall day, in hallways and so forth between panels. Uh, it even gives you a way to, to bits during a panel without disrupting the panel in the sense of I chat with people about the panel and say, oh, hey, that's neat. I didn't know that. Or I have a small little question, but which um, doesn't necessarily, which isn't covered in the panel, but um, is not as, high, as major of a thing that would be, to, that would potentially inter um, necessarily worth asking during the main panel itself. It also provides a way, like if you have like little gaps between panels, it gives a way to, for the panelists, if they are in attendance um, in the in the Discord, and hopefully they should be, um, to at, answer additional smaller questions after the panel. Um, like one of the things with like that you get with conventions is you have an attendee of a panel that you take questions. Maybe they take questions during the panel, but if they don't, sometimes they'll say, hey, ask me after the panel and go out in the hallway and talk about it there and that sort of thing. And this gives an opportunity for the, for panelists and attendees to do that. And additionally, it allows, it allows an option of for the panelists that if it's something they don't, that during the convention would put them on the spot and they wouldn't necessarily be able to answer right away by having it on the Discord chat, uh, it gives a chance to go, oh, I know what the answer for this is. I actually have the information on, it on my computer, but I would not necessarily be able to answer it readily during the ch um, during the panel time or in the hallway afterwards. I can now look it up and give you the answer right now. And not sorry, on the computer, but I was like, oh, I have the book like right over here on the bookshelf right next to me. I'm just going to reach over and grab it and look that thing up um, rather than, again, having to uh, answer the question on the spot during the panel and be able to say, I don't really know this very much. I can't answer it to you right now. Um, come back to me on social media afterwards, assuming the, the person you're asking remembers to come back to you on social media afterwards or something similar. So there's that up. So there's that as a recommendation as well. Um, that said, as a part of this is just in the same way that you need to have a trained staff to handle uh, complaints about conduct and that sort of thing, and don't behavior issues during the convention. This based, if you're doing a Discord, you do need to have a mod team as well. Treat moderate, take moderation on your Discord server as seriously as you take moderation during the panel. You, um, and this also means during the chat during panels as well. If people are like during cosplay contests and that sort of thing, if people are being unfiltered and gross about talking about cosplayers or female panelists, or people, or the panelists in general, and that sort of thing. If people are being harassing and gross and hateful and racist and misogynist and that sort of thing in the chat, even if the person who's doing the panel doesn't see it, that doesn't mean it's not happening, and that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have um, your admin staff, your moderators, there to deal with the situation. So, again, have a moderator, like have a trained moderator staff. Um, if you're doing uh, doing dedicated chats for panel rooms, particularly if questions for the panelists are being asked in the chat, make sure that you have moderators in those chat rooms, and also have people handy to take complaints and um, that sort of thing elsewhere as well. So get. Treat, take things as seriously there as you do during the otherwise. So that's my big convention thoughts, um, or digital convention thoughts. Do I want conventions to be all digital all the time in the future? No. I like, I certainly don't mind the convenience of all the work that I have to do to get ready to attend a convention, not as a panelist, but just as an attendee, is get up, have some coffee, and then sit at my computer or my television 
where I'm casting the uh, panel video to and watch the panel that way. I don't mind that. I, I like that level of convenience. It's certainly very useful. But that doesn't mean I would prefer it over the real thing. I like going to RTE. I like going to Moricon and seeing stuff in person. Um, there is no real substitute to, for example, when I went, when I saw, like, I saw Yoshitaka Amano do two live painting sessions in person at Portland Richard Camp in 2018. There isn't really a digital substitute for that. I mean, yes, I can watch the video. Like, I took video of Amano painting. And it got a lot of views at the time. Um, but that doesn't mean, like, it's like, oh, this is a replacement. This is what I, I, I'm... It's not, like... If given the choice between seeing him paint in per Amano paint in person, or another artist um, paint in person, and then um, watching a video, I'll pick seeing the painting in first person first, because there's, there's, there's stuff that comes with it uh, in terms of like seeing the whole, like of not having the laser focused view, but having kind of a way to, or to to shift my focus in a lot of respects to okay, right now I'm focusing currently on just what he's doing with the painting, while also kind of zooming out and saying, okay, what's what are the people around him doing? And that sort of thing. Like, oh, um somebody's coming over with um uh water water because they know that he's going to need to uh, wet down the campus, uh, the canvas, or for that matter, like he's done a bunch of stuff with put a bunch of paint. He's now going to wet it down afterwards so that it'll run and kind of drip a bit because he's going to be doing an effect with that. That sort of thing. Because that's stuff Amano does. Uh, if you watch my video. So, but it's watching the video and then seeing Amano, like, I, I, I'm way too laser focused on Amano there, partially because of where I'm sitting and partially because of how I'm filming it. And so you're missing those bits around the edges of this is the preparation stuff that's going on for um to do this picture. And also other stuff besides this, like, oh, there's a really big trip sheet that's Amano set up on because paint splattering down on the uh, paint paint and ink is splattering down on the drip sheet and all that sort of thing. It's like I like the video I recorded, it did pretty well in terms of uh Footage. I didn't monetize it, but in terms of the viewership, a lot of people watched it and apparently enjoyed it. But it's still very different. Like you're not getting the whole. You're seeing the picture. You're seeing the picture, but you're not getting the whole story of the making of the picture. Is I guess the best way to describe it. And that is something that I miss from convention, being convention person. And there's also just like general energy that I miss of being around people who have, who have a shared enthusiasm for a common thing and the energy that feeds off each other with that. Um, there are lots of, like, fandom has issues. Fandom has problems. And certainly there's a lot of people who've said, like, hey, fandom is not a great thing because of getting your identity wrapped up in a work, in, in a medium, artistic medium, or work of art, or a creator, or hobby, can lead to a degree of entitlement about that. And I agree that that is a problem. But, on the other hand, being in a place, a physical place, with a lot of people who are passionate about a thing, and want to share that thing with others, and when you also have a similar passion, is exciting. It's energizing, and it rech it's recharging, and the thing where when you come away from it, you come away, like, a little men like, a little physically exhausted, but in, but not in the, oh, I'm worn out, it's been a hard day at work kind of way. It's in the, I ran, it's the, I ran a marathon way. Or the, I, I completed a physically enduring task that I feel good about having done. And so you, you so you certainly need a day or so, like I always felt that I need a day or so after convention to recover. But even with that additional day of recovery, I 
feel excited and engaged. And when I go back to work afterwards, I am ready to go in a way like I feel more excited and enthusiastic and happy in a way that I don't necessarily get from um, just other general stuff. And something not from, from digital conventions. I mean, I, I get a little bit of that, but not in the same way. Um, and it's particularly like an interesting thing to, for, for me to kind of contemplate and explain as a person with autism, because by all rights, I should hate conventions. It's a giant pile of sensory overload. Um, it's being around tons of people who are talking at the same time with music playing and all this, that, and the other thing. But I don't hate it. I love it. It's great. It's a thing that it's a thing that helps get me through get me through my year. It's the thing that they're the things that I look forward to. Um like Christmas and that sort of thing. Like I want this. I look forward to this. I'm excited to be a part of this in a way uh, that a lot of other things like don't, not a depression sense, but in a in a shared enthusiasm sense. It's it's like going to a rock concert over several days. It's a blast. And I miss it, and I hope it comes back. Um, so, that's my thoughts. What are your digital convention experiences that you've had? Um, what things have you experienced where you think, oh, this worked for me, this didn't work for me, how things should things change? Um, post in the comments below. I'm interested to hear it. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.